everyone, and thank you for joining us for a unique episode of the Animal Care Systems webinar series. I'm your host, Austin Carell. Thanks to the companies also participating in this webinar series and to ALAS for continuing to help distribute the series through the ACE community. Today's presenter is Dr. Cindy Buckmaster. Dr. Buckmaster is the Director for Public Outreach with the National Animal Interest Alliance and the public speaker and advocate for animal welfare and biomedical progress. Dr. Buckmaster earned her PhD in neurobiology and behavior from Stony Brook. She is the former director of the Center for Comparative Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and she also has served as ALAS president. Animal Care Systems is pleased to host Dr. Buckmaster today. The title of her seminar is Homes for Animal Heroes. The truth has never felt so good. If you have a question for Dr. Buckmaster, please use the question pane in the control panel and we will answer as many questions as we can after the presentation. During the webinar, Homes for Animal Heroes will accept live donations. Homes for Animal Heroes is a program of the National Animal Interest Alliance, itself a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and there is a link to the donation page within the chat pane of the control panel. And now please welcome Dr. Cindy Buckmaster. Hello. I want to talk to you today uh, about Home Family Heroes, and, and I've called it The Truth Has Never Felt So Good, and you'll see why in a little bit. Um, some of you, maybe maybe most of you, are aware of the program. Um, we have, gosh, I pitched it in 2014 to the National Animal Interest Alliance, and uh, and that's actually the 501c3 of which Home Free Animal Heroes is a program. Um, so I pitched to them in uh, 2014. It took us a little while to get set up. Um, and I spoke to many of you over that time trying to share with you the vision I had for how Homes for Animal Heroes could be uh, a real platform for educating the public, a very unique platform for educating the public about our truth, our truth with respect to uh, how we care about our animals, our truth with respect to why they're still necessary in research. Um, and a lot of it was prompted because another organization I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about called the Beagle Freedom Project uh, came into existence, right? But before we get to that, uh, let's pursue the truth related to dogs and research uh, just a bit, okay? So I don't know how many of you have read this book. It's a nice little book. It's called Heal. It's cute because there's a dog in heel, but heel, like heel, and it was written by Arlene Weintraub, who very sadly lost her sister to a gastric cancer. Um, and after that, she went on this little journey related to understanding how dogs uh, in research uh, are actually a part of the biomedical process and, and why they're valuable. And it turns out that, um, not surprisingly, dogs get uh, a lot of the same cancers we get. In some cases, if you take dog tissue and human tissue and you put them each beneath a microscope, to a trained eye, they're indistinguishable. So the cancers can be that similar, and that's, of course, what makes dogs a really good model. And the other really, really great news when it comes to this sort of One Health approach is that um, the dogs also benefit from the research directly, right? So that's, that's pretty amazing. Now, it shouldn't be a big surprise. Uh, that humans and dogs get many of the same diseases, and it doesn't stop with cancer. Well, we get a lot of the same diseases, and it, and it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. We've, we've grown up together, right? Um, we've been in this sort of uh, partnership, this really heartfelt, um, really deep partnership with dogs uh, for as long, well, probably since the beginning of, of civilization, since the beginning of humans and dogs, right? Um, and so we've grown up together over the centuries and we, we experience the same environments, right? They sleep in our beds, they sleep in our homes, they share the same air, they share, they share some of the same food. Um, they're exposed to the same irritants and so on and so forth. So um, I think that probably has at least something to do with why we have so much in common when it comes to um, our health and the diseases we share with dogs. Um, just to give you a, a little kind of smattering of some of the ways by which dogs have been valuable models for helping people. Um, here is, and it's not an exhaustive list, but a list of treatments and innovations that have been made possible because of uh, the value of dogs in the biomedical research process.
and again, that's not an exhaustive list, but it's an impressive list. Um, and if I could see you, you'd be making all these ooh and ah faces, but I can't see you, so I'm going to pretend. And I can't wait till this is over so I can see you all and hug you all again. Moving on. The work with dogs is also obviously then help dogs. And here again is a, a small list of uh, treatments and therapies that have been made available for dogs as a consequence of research, biomedical research with dogs. So again, uh, not a giant list because there are more, um, but nonetheless very impressive. All of these ways that dogs have helped us live uh, more comfortable lives and saved our lives in many cases, and the same is true for them. And there are more and more of these One Health initiatives springing up all over the country in, in partnerships between uh, veterinary clinics and uh, vet schools and med schools and academic research centers and so on and so forth. So, Really, really amazing stuff. Now, for those of us in lab animal medicine who care for these animals, um, we have to say goodbye to most of them, right? Um, in most cases, our animals are euthanized, and that's uh, because the answers are in the tissues, and uh, that's hard for us. We know that when we first start working with our animals, that our time together is short, and we do everything we can to make the most of that time together. Um, and, and to provide for these animals in the way that they deserve for everything they contribute. Um, <clears throat> but it's hard for us, uh, really hard, no matter how prepared we are. That, that's, a tough, that's a tough pill to swallow. Um, but the really, really exciting thing that also does happen, not as often, but more often than people think, is that uh, not all of our dogs do have to be euthanized. Um, and in, and in some cases, uh, I would say many cases, we can find them homes, right? We can rehome them. We can, we can place them with new adoptive owners um, who can provide them with a long and loving life. And when we get to do that, that is like the best thing ever. Um, it erases all the other pain we have, at least for a moment. <laughs> um, and it, and it's, it's really the highlight. It's our highlight of, of, of our careers, really, when we can do that. And we don't just do it with dogs, right? We do it with, gosh, we do it with everything, rats and livestock and fish and chinchillas and rabbits and you know all kind everything we can adopt out uh, we do i did a, a a poll once across the country and uh, even tarantulas were on that list which i thought was uh, the disgusting i would never adopt a tarantula i don't like spiders they scare the hell well i like them i like that they do really nice things i just don't like them near me they scare the hell out of me <laughs> anyway um but we've been doing this for a while, and, uh, and most of us have been doing our own adoptions internally, either to our own employees or to people we know. And, you know, in that same poll, I learned that for over 40 years, uh, institutions all across this country, including Alaska, have been adopting research animals out uh, when possible. So this isn't new for us, um, and that makes sense because it's something we really, really enjoy. Um, this was uh, a dog that I knew. He was in one of my programs. His name is Leon. And he was able to find a home, and he's very, very happy there uh, with one of our graduate students. So here are a couple other dogs I want to introduce you to. Um, their names for this presentation are Andy and Kipper. And Andy and Kipper were best buddies. Um, so they were together for years, um, I think about four years, and they were inseparable. And uh, the institution that had these dogs refused. They had a very well, first of all, they had an established adoption program. They'd had it for 30 years or so at the time. Um, but they refused to adopt these two out uh, individually. They really had to go together. And of course, that meant that they had to hold on to them longer because it was more difficult, even though beagles are small, <laughs> to find a home that would take two. And so they had a young woman who was the sort of coordinator for their adoption efforts at this institution. And I spoke with her. Um, and she actually shared this email with me and they, they were really super excited because a young couple had reached out to them because their adoption program was known um, and they worked with the public in the past. And this young couple reached out to them to let them know, hey, um, we'll take them both. We'll take, we'll take Andy and Kipper together. We don't want to separate them. And, uh, and so she was so excited. And the night before uh, they came to get Andy and Kipper, um, she, she wrote them this email and I'll read to you a part of it. Hello, Mark and Kate. As promised, I wanted to send you some additional information regarding Andy and Kipper's adoption. 
We are all so happily surprised that you've decided to open your hearts and home to both boys, and we're thrilled that they will have a big brother like Benson to show them the ropes. So, so excited. They've waited so long for this. Um, you know, and then there was more information about they're going to give them crates and you should use a harness because they don't know what the traffic is and so on and so forth. Um, and this is what they're eating. And, and it was just this beautiful moment. And on May 29th, 2013, they were adopted together. Super, super exciting. And then in less than a week, this post appeared on the Beagle Freedom Project's website. These are the same two dogs. They were renamed Isaac and Snuggles, and they were referred to on the website as the Beagle Freedom Project's first East Coast rescue. Here is uh, the wording and the picture right from the website at the time. So uh, you could probably read this, but for those of you with small screens, uh, Isaac and Snuggle spent four years each in a pharmaceutical lab and during pharmacologically, I can't, hold on, pharmacological kinetic testing. Both boys arrived to us with worms and skin rashes. After the years in the lab, they were sold to a vet kennel where for a couple of months they were used to teach students how to handle and care for lab animals. These are the actual words. This is the next paragraph. And we're going to, um, okay, come on now. And we're going to uh, look at these words carefully in a moment. Thanks to a friendly contact, the Beagle Freedom Project was able to arrange for their release, and they are already on their journey to recovery. Their first few moments of real freedom, exploration, and cautious affection are a heart melting reminder that they are survivors, a lucky couple in a country with 70,000 just like them still languishing in the labs. Now, many of you have heard me talk about the Beagle Freedom Project before, and I'm, I'm going to I'm going, to speak, I'm going to frame this a little differently uh, for this talk because um, I want you to see this from a more global perspective. Beagle Freedom Project is not working in isolation when it comes to the attack on dogs and research. Many of the animal rights groups are fully aware that the dog is a gateway species because they know that the public loves dogs. And the Beagle Freedom Project's role in all of this was to prove that was to bring more and more supporters um, because they had the dog, because they were showing the dog, to attract the eyes and the ears and the hearts to the story of the dog. Um, and so, so this was their role. And so they were very careful in the beginning to frame themselves uh, a bit carefully. They wanted to look like, uh, for the public's, for the purpose of the public, you know, just, just people who love dogs and want to find them homes. Um, and so they never wanted to use any really uh, outlandish or caustic language like uh, the likes of PETA, for example. Um, so they were, but they, they did use very, very, I think in some ways, uh, more dangerous words. Um, and I'll give you an example of some of those right here. So they, here we go, all right. So you'll see in that first paragraph where the, the orange letters, the orange words are uh, sort of highlighted. These are just ordinary common words but they, but they bring it's sort of the music behind the words. When you hear these words, there's a feeling that comes over you, right? Um, so this is not a harmless word. So they spent four years in a lab enduring some testing. When, when, you, when you hear the word enduring, you feel a pain connected to that. You, you endure something that's horrible, something you can't get out of. You know, this, this is the word enduring is, is actually a very um, manipulative word. And so they don't have to say, you know, that uh, researchers are just evil monsters uh, like PETA does. They do something much more dangerous. They, they, they frame themselves as people who just care about animals and wanna find them homes while they're feeding the public who loves animals, especially dogs, these terms that really turn their hearts on fire and it starts spinning their perspective almost subconsciously about how animals in biomedical research are cared for. Um, once they get, they get you, once they, they do that and now they've got your undivided attention, they take some additional liberties. In this case, they say that both boys arrived with worms and skin rashes. Um, as you probably guessed by now since I have that email, I was in direct contact with this institution and uh, we went through vet records and everything else and I can assure you that this is not true. If you look at the pictures of these animals, this picture that they showed on their own website was taken less than one week after the animals were adopted and I think you'll see and agree with me that they're very healthy, but it doesn't matter. Once they have you in, they can tell you whatever they want. You're not gonna listen to the research community because we've been demonized with, with innocent words like enduring 
a little later on there, um, let's say after the years in the lab, they were sold to a vet kennel where for a couple of months they were used to teach students how to handle and care. They put that in quotes for a reason. Um, and I think the suggestion is that how could people like us even talk about care, right? This is, this is the kind of thing that they're trying to get their audience, the general public, which includes legislators, by the way, to tune into you know, the music behind the words. It's not obvious. It's not crazy. It's, it's worse. It's, it's almost subliminal, right? And then again, to care for, in quotes, laboratory animals. And, and the thing there is that they are always saying that there's no difference between uh, a laboratory animal and, uh, and an animal in your house. And that's actually true. But they, uh, they, they use that, that um, suggestion in a, in a very specific way. Um, Goes on down here. Thanks for friendly contact. The Beagle Freedom Project was able to arrange for their release. I love this. They were able to arrange for their release. Let me tell you what happened here. They exploited an institution that had been known to offer Beagles for adoption to the public for decades. <laughs> they knew it. And what they did is they got a couple of their supporters. Mark and Kate, and I don't know if Kate's really her name, but I know that Mark is the actual name um, because I have a Facebook, uh, a screenshot of a Facebook post from Mark. They got their supporters to go in there and pose as adopters, as legitimate adopters. That's not arranging for their release. Arranging for the release makes it appear to the public as though they went in there, they, they swooped in as some sort of, you know, hotshot negotiators and convinced these people to give up those dogs so they could save them. Those dogs were going to be adopted to somebody as a pair, whether they swooped in or not. So that's just pure exploitation. And then you can see what they do with this information. Right? We are the heroes. And if they're the heroes, then what are we? You see where I'm going with this. They're already on their journey to recovery. These are innocent words, but a journey to recovery. Journey to recovery suggests, gosh, they have so much work to do to recover from, this, from so many things. Um, and, so this is just part of their game. And as we know from the dogs um, that we've seen, even in their own videos, um, the dogs are almost instantly social with each other and people. They're fat and shiny and healthy. And, uh, and everything that they say uh, that they aren't while they're playing the sad music in the background. And they go on, you know, they show cautious affection and you get it. And then they hit you in the end with, by the way, now that we've got you understanding how awful this is, and you know, you can see that we're the good guys here, and we know that you feel the same way we do. What should, we just want to remind you that 70,000 more like them are languishing in the labs. And languishing, of course, is also a very powerful word, right? Here's the next uh, couple of lines straight from the website. Isaac has been adopted to a family in Maine and has already made incredible progress. Snuggles is currently with a foster family in New York and is also doing well. They separated them. These people who claim to care so much about these dogs separated them. Of course, the public didn't know the real story. Um, Mark, the, fa um, uh, the Facebook, the screenshot I have of his Facebook post, identifies himself as dad for a day in one of his posts. Um, and so what they'd done is they went in as supporters of the Beagle Freedom Project, posed as legitimate adopters, and both dogs were shipped off, shipped off to different states and separated after all. Which, when I tell this to people in person, and I'm sure it's happening there, but I can't hear you, <laughs> um, is really, really upsetting. Um, and this institution didn't want that. And the contract they had stipulated that that wasn't allowed. But everybody left them alone. Um, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. Um, so that was uh, what they called their first East Coast rescue. And that was in 2013. The organization started December 2010. It sort of became official. Um, so really, from the beginning of 2011 to present, they've been active. Then they wanted to make a splash with a West Coast rescue. So they did a similar thing and exploited another uh, program on the West Coast in California that was also known for adopting animals out um, after a vet students had been done doing some non-invasive training with these animals. And so um, there's a waiting list for them and uh, the public enjoyed this. And so uh, they got an application from a woman who identified herself as Katie Johnson. And Katie Johnson, I believe, is that blonde woman 
in the middle of this picture here. And Katie Johnson had an address all the way in, Cal uh, in California, rather. Um, this is where this institution is. And, um, and she went and adopted this dog. Um, and that was on November 3rd, 2013. The very next morning, November 4th, 2013, she was posing with this dog, Jerry the Beagle, and a bunch of Beagle Freedom Project supporters on the California State Capitol in front of the news crews that had been arranged in advance. And of course, uh, they told tales about how this animal was cared for and you know that uh, he didn't have a chance to play and he was tested on his whole puppy life. And of course, none of that was true, but that was the game. So let me introduce you to this woman in the middle here, um, and who she really is. Her name is actually Shannon Keith, and uh, she uh, is uh, the president of an organization called um, Animal Rescue Media and Education, and I'll show you that in a minute, but here's some things about Shannon. She's an animal rights attorney. She's an animal rights activist, I would say extremist. Uh, she's a documentarian. She's a director and producer, very, very talented. She is the president and founder of ARMY, and there it is, Animal Rescue Media Education. You can see the logo down the lower left. That lock looks like it's been cut or opened. That will give you uh, an idea of what her angle is when it comes to animals and research. Very uh, animal liberation front feeling. There's a reason for that. She is an ALF and a Shack supporter. <clears throat> In 2006, she wrote a movie or produced a movie and directed it <clears throat> called Behind the Mask. And it's a, a film that actually glorifies the Animal Liberation Front um, as victims for a greater cause. Um, and so that's sort of where she's coming from. But Jack, of course, is the stop Huntington animal cruelty that began uh, in the UK. And I have to say, I've seen some of the videos, some of that footage uh, that prompted this rage um, from the UK. Um, I saw them because a, a good friend of mine in security showed them, and uh, and I still can't shake them from my mind. I would be, I can see why they were furious. What happened, at least in some of those instances, was absolutely inexcusable, and those people were dealt with, uh, but it should never have happened. Um, the problem is that these folks can't move on, and they can't, they can't, well, they're not really interested in that. They don't want to move on. They're, they're, they're sitting, they're lying in wait, the animal rights people, all the time, waiting for some poster child somewhere to show up and do something horrible so they can they can you know paint this broad stroke uh, across all of biomedical research and 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 tell the public that that's what's happening and then they show these horrific snippets um, and those some of those were horrific um, and the public because they don't hear from us and it hasn't been easy for us to communicate with them uh, in part because of threats from animal rights extremists uh, they don't hear anything from us except no comment and so they're left to believe that gosh, this stuff must be true, and then these animal rights folks ride the wave of momentum uh, for that. Now, Shannon was also the attorney, the defense attorney for Kevin Kajonas. And Kevin Kajonas, uh, I'll introduce you to him right now. Kevin Kajonas, who uh, changed his name to Kevin Chase when he got involved with the Beagle Freedom Project, was actually a former ALF spokesman, both in the UK and uh, he uh, and here and he started the uh, Shack USA campaign, which you know sh <laughs> the Huntington Group here is not this you know this is the same company, but the same people were not here as they were in the UK. And this is another example of what I mean, where they just kind of extend these associations, um, and they use the momentum of the campaign in the UK to come here and create trouble for our friends and colleagues in New Jersey, who. Um, were treating their animals the way they should have been treated. And so this is this is how that sort of grew. So he is an actually an Animal Liberation Front guy. Um, and she was his defense attorney. He ended up in jail for uh, the shack stuff. And you can look that up if you want. Um, it, was, it was pretty appalling. But at the end of the day, uh, he was in jail, jail for six years. Uh, he's a convicted felon. And his charges are there, are there for you to see conspiracy to violate the Animal Enterprise Protection Act, which was uh, strengthened in part because of what he and his uh, co-conspirators had created in this campaign uh, to the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. Uh, conspiracy to stalk, three counts of interstate stalking, conspiracy to harass using a telecommunications device. Um, you can look up Kevin uh, maybe after this talk to get a sense of uh, of 
what kind of a person he is. Um, he's got a couple different personalities. He can come off as this really innocent guy who really loves animals. And I actually have no doubt that Kevin loves beagles. I think he really, really does. He also, um, he also has decided that any kind of research with animals is completely unacceptable and he's going to do everything he can, just like Shannon Keith, to end that. Now, once, once he got out of prison, um, he, was, he had an operations role and then, and I put here in italics, he was the VP of Army's Beagle Freedom Project. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, but he was the VP of Army's Beagle Freedom Project for as long as that lasted. So what was their point? Their point was um, to get a hold of dogs and use dogs um, as sort of a platform for drawing attention, right? Getting all, you know, if you want people to, if you want people to hear you, they have to pay attention to you. They have to see you. And if you want them to see you, hold up a gorgeous, shiny, little cute beagle that's kissing you and wiggling all over the place and people will look. And so this is exactly what they did. And when they had their attention, they started feeding them propaganda. Um, then they took it up a notch. Um, and I don't know how many of you remember this, but the, the identity campaign was a big deal. And you can see this is from their website. It's, I don't think it's there anymore. Um, but how you can adopt an animal imprisoned in a lab. OK, so the language is becoming less subtle now. <laughs> um, and this was amazing. It was a very clever uh, campaign. And they, they got a lot of support, a lot of donations with it, just to break it down for you quickly. Um, they had a big, long list of uh, dogs and cats and their uh, animal IDs in the institutions they lived in that they had FOIA'd a couple of years before. So this giant list and their supporters or anybody interested could go to their website and uh, choose one to virtually adopt. Um, and then if you gave them $50, they would give you some of these little dog tags here with that information on it. So you could tell more people the story about how they also could help and that they could do this very same thing and don't go yet because the next thing you got was a a fully complete FOIA request asking for everything under the sun, every document you can think of. And those of you on this call or on this webinar know how much documentation that is. Um, they filled it out for the people who came in and applied to virtually adopt. They got this, they got this FOIA request um, and all they had to do was send it to the appropriate place and put their name in it. So it was, it was a sort of crowdsourcing of FOIA requests and uh, state institutions just got bombarded and locked down um, with this, and uh, and it was quite a nuisance for a while. It did slow research, which is exactly what they were hoping for. But the the other thing they were hoping for is that when people got their hands on these FOIA requests, the Beagle Freedom Project said, "Hey, send them back to us, because we can create yet even more propaganda. We can see what these studies are. We can spin them to our liking, and then we can go out and start attacking institutions because we know that they're working with dogs. And we know what kind of work they're doing." And then we can spin that and create more propaganda and get more money. Why? Not because we want to rehome research dogs. That's easy. You just say, hey, we want to help. That's not what they're after. And they said so themselves in some of their own posts. What they were really after doing was changing the law. And so after they developed enough resources, they got busy using uh, Shannon Keith's uh, uh, attorney skills. And they promoted this thing called the Beagle Freedom Bill. Now, at this point, I think everybody on this webinar has heard of the Beagle Freedom Bill. Um, and they, they frame it as this, you know, this is just an innocent bill. This is, you know, it's, it's just uh, an opportunity for institutions that haven't been able to, for whatever reason, um, to adopt animals out to, uh, you know, a shelter or a nonprofit group, like, for example, the Beagle Freedom Project. They want our dogs, since they have our dogs, and they can spin more propaganda and get to their ultimate agenda, right? This is really not about finding research dogs' homes. It never has been about that. If they cared about dogs, they wouldn't have split those other two up. The agenda, and they do care about dogs, but the agenda they care more about. So they started going to uh, different states and, and proposing these bills, these Beagle Freedom Bills, which, and think of that name, the Beagle Freedom Bill. Just having a bill named that, in front of all those legislators and in the media for the public to see. You know, it's in and of itself this sort of victimization of research dogs. Um, and those of you who work with dogs and love them every day like I have, take offense to that. Um, which is not to say that some of the animals in research don't struggle. I don't want to be ridiculous about this. But, but they, are, they are villainizing us. They are demonizing us in very unfair ways. And Beagle Freedom Bill, is the title just allows that to live on, right? And then they get all these supporters who want to pass the Beagle Freedom Bill. And when it passes, yay, we're doing something to end this work with dogs. 
And those same people who are passing and voting for these bills do not understand at all what I showed you in the beginning of this talk, which is that this work with dogs is still very necessary. They happen to be extremely powerful models for biomedical research, and not just for people, but for dogs as well. Be that as it may, when you when you present a bill like this, which it really just says, hey, you know, when they're done contributing to science, we want them to find homes. Doesn't everybody want that? And of course, every legislator in the room says yes. <laughs> and uh, and it is my opinion, um, and I think I'm right about this, that anytime this bill is is put up it will pass in one form or another. Um, they also tend to pepper them and they've gotten smarter as time goes on with uh, things that seem innocent enough to the untrained eye like that of a legislator who's not familiar with biomedical research or the regulatory expectations and requirements surrounding it, but they'll pepper it with you know, uh, reporting that's already being done. So sort of the, this in the true form it's true form regulatory burden, asking for information that's already provided them just to just to, to create issues, right? The other thing is they want to be able to control the IACO. Um, they have a whistleblower page up on their website for institutions that live in the states where this law has passed, and I'm going to list them for you in a minute. So you can imagine a caregiver who loves a dog who doesn't necessarily understand the course of the study, depending on the institution, thinks this dog, he wants to take him home, let's say, and uh, and then he finds out that this dog is Part of a terminal study and the dog isn't there anymore and he's upset so he calls the Beagle Freedom Project and says hey they, they broke the law when in fact they didn't because the dog was never eligible for retirement but you can see where this goes right and and then uh, the Beagle Freedom Project just spends all kinds of time now harassing whoever this institution is state or private if there's a law <laughs> um, and bombarding the IA cook and the institution with requests and proof and so on and so forth and it really is just to make life so miserable and difficult when it comes to doing research with dogs that you just stop doing it. Here's a list of the states uh, that have a legal freedom, uh, well, a, 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 a compulsory adoption law, a rehoming law, um, Maine, uh, the legal freedom bill, passed in Minnesota, that was the first one, that was 2014, that uh, happens to be where Kevin Kajonis is from. And then in 2015, they picked up California, Connecticut, and Nevada. 2016, after a couple of tries, they finally got New York. They got Illinois after a couple of tries in 2017. Then they got Maryland, Delaware, and Rhode Island in 2018. They picked up Oregon in 2019, and there were two more uh, rehoming bills passed in Washington. In New Jersey, Washington in 2019, and New Jersey in 2020, that are a different color, and I'll get to that in a little bit. You'll see if you go to their website and you look under state bills that they're working kind of on Massachusetts, Texas, and Virginia. Um, Texas has come through a couple times now, and we keep going to try and defeat it, um, and uh, it's been pushed back. But I guarantee you that um, no matter how many times it's pushed back, at some point, these things will pass everywhere. Um, very importantly, they have some federal legislation in play, and that's this uh, HR 2850 that you see in red, which uh, is a whole other story, right? And basically what this says is that if you get federal funding um, to do research wherever you are, then this will be a requirement to rehome those dogs afterward. To the best of my knowledge, there's no mention of resources with which to do that, um, but that's a whole other story. Uh, for those of you who are interested in looking into this, it's called the Humane Retirement Act, and uh, and I advise that folks go to this website, congress.gov, and we can follow a whole bunch of bills. Um, our friends at Neighbor are always tipping us off to a variety of legislative initiatives that are underway. Um, so if you see a bill there that interests you, you can go to congress.gov. I put this here to show you that uh, it was pretty much introduced in May of 2019, and it has 70 co-sponsors to date. I just pulled this off this morning. So 70 is, is a lot of legislators who are signed on to this. Um, and again, this is something we'd all love, but we have to have the resources to be able to do it. Um, let me tell you how they envisioned it. This is from their website. <laughs> Um, and this is, these are their words where they're begging their supporters for help to, to get this thing passed, help us pass the Humane Retirement Act. It mirrors our state legislation and requires labs and facilities to offer dogs and cats for adoption after study. Instead of killing them, and look at what's highlighted, to a humane society or nonprofit animal rescue organization like, guess who? The Beagle Freedom Project. They want our dogs. Of course they want our dogs. When they have our dogs, 
they have everybody's attention. They own the propaganda. And that's the thing I need you to understand. Whoever owns the adoption issue owns the conversation with the public, including the legislators. The Beagle Freedom Project has owned this issue for a while, and they're having and they're doing a great job with it. Um, they are, they're getting very, very far. You go down in the second paragraph there, they make this point of saying, and they put it in all caps, you know, that laboratories do not want to release these animals, or they simply can't do it because their hands are tied. So this is the message to the public, and this is on their, you know, they have a little page where you can complete, you know, the letter writing campaign to legislators to get this thing passed. Um, so this is what they've been up to since uh, Mr. Kajonas got out of prison. Um, and I have to say that deception pays. Um, this is a list of, uh, of their annual revenue since they started. Remember I told you in December 2010, they sort of incorporated. So they had a full year to raise funds in 2011. They raised half a million bucks. They raised about the same in 2012. And then in 2013, they raised twice as much. 2013 is special because that was the year, if you remember back from the dates of the adoptions I showed you, that was the year they realized, aha, if we can get into these programs and adopt some of these dogs and use them as sort of mascots or ambassadors for propaganda, we can really, we can really up the ante here. And they did. They brought in another half a million that year and they've been steady at a million in 2014. In 2015, they raised another half a million. For those of you who remember, that's because they got their uh, famous celebrity friends to help them win a $500 million grant from Microsoft who apologized afterward, but didn't do anything to make it right for the animal research community. Um, but then even still, once they got that rolling, um, you know, they went up, sorry, another, another uh, half a million in 2016. And they're steady at about $2 million in donations a year. Um, and so, you know, people say, well, how do they do that? Well, they've got this tremendous following that they created uh, by using our dogs and lying about them. Um, and then they hold these big fancy galas where they, they rake in all kinds of money and they try to do this annually. And I want to I want to show you this slide for a reason. So they were planning one of these big galas in 2017. And uh, Eric Trump, our president's son's wife, Lara, is a big supporter of, you know, adopting research animals. And she's a bit anti-research herself, and uh, she had established a, a friendship of sorts with Kevin Chase, who was calling himself Kevin Chase at the time, and and uh, she thought this was great, and he convinced her, um, you know, her, her father-in-law had just been elected the year before, so this was going to be a big name, he convinced her to come and speak at this gala, and they thought they would raise all of this money, and so uh, the reporter for Politico, Aaron Samuelson, is listed here, happened to contact uh, Patty Strand, who is the president of the National Animal Interest Alliance uh, and co-founder of Homes for Animal Heroes with me, um, because she's an expert on dog matters. And that what he found out was the truth about who Kevin Chase slash Cajonis actually was. And the whole um, point of his article shifted. And uh, you can see it here. Now, the interesting thing about that is, remember I showed you in the beginning, uh, I put in italics that he was the vice president for the Beagle Freedom Project. Uh, within a month or so, he vanished uh, from the role in that organization. And I don't, I don't know where he is, but I don't see his name anywhere associated with them. So uh, NAIA revealed the truth and, uh, and Kevin is hiding someplace. I'm sure he's very active, but he has stepped down from his very notable role as, a, as an animal rights extremist and ALF person who was uh, a representative of the Beagle Freedom Project because they need to maintain on some level this, you know, sort of what they portray as an innocent goal of really just wanting to find uh, animals, pet, you know, homes, pets, make them pets afterward. What did they do uh, with some of that money? Okay, so they got a lot of money. What was next? Well, this was what was next. They decided to uh, build a rescue and outreach center. They're calling it The Rock. The acronym is The Rock, R-O-C, The Rock. And this was actually a, a mock-up of it there in California. This was supposed to be in Hollywood, and that's what it was going to look like. And, and this was from their website. Let me tell you what they show you what they plan to do uh, with this rock, this research and outreach center. Uh, it was going to house the offices for their uh, growing um, team of BFP volunteers and uh, and workers. 
It would include large indoor and outdoor dog park-like space for the public and press to interact with the lucky liberated animals. The public and press could come in and interact with all of these little ambassadors for propaganda that they had assembled in their rock. It would include dedicated space for school presentations and video showings and exhibits about animal testing. One can only imagine what they would include and also provide innovative ways for everybody to help. That was their plan for the rock. Basically, it was to create a propaganda warehouse. What kind of propaganda? Propaganda just like this. Dear laboratory animals, you know that behind those bars you are suffering. You might think you're alone in that cold metal world, but you have not been forgotten. Today we're making you a promise. We are coming for you. Right now there are thousands of people fighting for you. Our identity campaign has already produced lawsuits and exposed your story to the world. Right now, in state capitals across the United States, we are forcing these stubborn labs to free you, even if they don't want to. And right now, your story is being heard across the world, online, on TV, and in newspapers. Millions have seen your brothers and sisters touch grass for the first time. You might be stuck in a cage far away, but nowhere is too far. In 2015, we traveled over 110,000 miles rescuing other animals, just like you. And while you're waiting in that cage for us to come, know that we have thousands of families eagerly waiting for you. And when they wrap their arms around you, they will show you what love is like. And we will not stop until you are safe in our arms. And we have already rescued over 500 animals from laboratories. And we are trying to free you next. In 2016, your cage door will open. No matter the distance, no matter the price, we are coming for you. Love from the Beagle Freedom Project and supporters everywhere. Please join Beagle Freedom Project today to make sure tomorrow holds brighter opportunities for dogs and other animals still stuck in the labs. So you can see uh, what they were after there. Um, and so something interesting happened and they do one of these year end videos. Uh, that was that was the only one like that. And there's a reason for that. Um, so this this particular rock that you see here never actually happened uh, because they changed their name and their philosophy. And this is a thing everyone needs to understand. The dogs are a gateway species. They are a gateway species for removing all animals from research. If they, can, if they can get in with the dog and remarkable progress is being made, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes and not just by them. Um, but what the Beagle Freedom Project has really served to do among their colleagues and the other animal rights organizations is to fertilize the ground <laughs> um, and, and create an awareness and grow an awareness of, uh, of, uh, of propaganda that that people believe is true, including our lawmakers, right? So their role was really just to create this sort of public relations campaign that was filled with misinformation and grab people by the heartstrings, uh, influential people, legislators, in fact, anybody listening, and get them to believe something that is not true in order for them to act in legislative ways to end research with dogs. They were very successful at that by 2016. They were raised, raising over $2 million a year. Sorry, $2 million a year. So they didn't build this. Instead, what they did is they changed their name. And I remember all of us saying, what was that all about? They changed their name to 
the Rescue Plus Freedom Project instead. And what they did then is they built a huge uh, sort of uh, community, right, um, in the Santa Monica Mountains of California that wouldn't serve the same serve, uh, purpose as the rock that I just shared with you, right? So there'd be opportunities for dogs to be there, but there would also be opportunities for other kinds of lab animals to be there. So they have two goats that they say they rescued, quote unquote. I don't know how they got them. They were adopted to them, obviously. Uh, if they were from a research institution, we have no way of verifying any of that. We, there were pigs there, there were some rabbits there, certainly there were some beagles there. And so they, they changed their name and the point was to let folks know that, hey, it's not just beagles and dogs anymore. Um, we are expanding. We, we know that dogs are a gateway species. We are through the gate. <laughs> and we are now expanding our mission to, uh, you know, propagating more nonsense, planting more seeds so that this, uh, mis this incorrect sort of awareness will grow in the minds and hearts of the public, including those legislators. And so we're going to have this rescue and outreach center. Um, and we'll also take other animals from other situations. And nobody knows why that is for certain. Um, if they had enough uh, research animals uh, in play, I'm not really sure why they would have to include others. But in either case, uh, this was opened in September of 2018. And then, as many of you know, something horrific happened in California. And they had all these wildfires. And you know, two months later, the whole thing was gone, burned to the ground. Uh, the animals were OK. They were able to move them and the animals were fine. There weren't all that many of them, from what I can tell. Um, but the place burned at the ground and that was that. So then they decided, okay, well, uh, we're gonna change our name again. <laughs> um, and so they had a whole Facebook page that really is just about this, that the Rescue Plus Freedom Project is now the Beagle Freedom Project again. And I think they may have lost some brand recognition there and they were concerned about momentum. But the mission is the same, right? So now they have this expanded mission of accepting all kinds of lab animals so they can uh, continue to spread propaganda about how all of these animals are cared for. Um, but there's still the Beagle Freedom Project so people know who they are, so they got the best of both worlds. And so what they did next was quite interesting. And I remember uh, some folks asking, you know, well, why did they do this? Now these are West Coast people and they had built their their first place in the West Coast, and they had planned for the original place to be on the West Coast, and yet they came all the way to the East Coast, to North Carolina, to build another rock. And uh, they purchased some land on a farm, and you can see some of it represented here. There are barns and other buildings, um, and this is in Lincolnton, North Carolina, about 45 minutes or so from Charlotte, North Carolina, and it opened in October 2019. Now, you have to wonder what are they really up to? Is this really just about giving people, uh, research institutions, an opportunity to put their animals there and they'll find homes for them? Is, is that really what they're after? Well, according to their own webpage, no. What they say very clearly here in the second paragraph is the Beagle Freedom Project started the fight against animal testing and we're going to end it. So their, their goal is to end all animal-based research. So why are they on the East Coast? I keep telling you that they've just sort of planted the seeds, they fertilized the ground for a larger movement that includes their, their animal rights colleagues. And here are a few of them who have ridden on uh, the momentum of the awareness of propaganda that the Beagle Freedom Project has created amongst the public, including our legislators. These other groups have been able to capitalize on all of that propaganda and all of those, those, those misinformed hearts and minds to push their own agendas. They're on the East Coast because that's where the government animals are. Like I said before, whoever owns the adoption issue owns the conversation. I'm not going to go into details here, but I do want to show you uh, a few examples of how other animal rights groups have sort of jumped onto this uh, this campaign and this this new understanding, or I should call I should call it a misunderstanding that the public has in their hearts and their minds about dogs and research, because the Beagle Freedom Project, I believe, had a role in feeding their success. On the left there, you see this uh, report, Spending to Death, that's done by a group called the White Coat Waste Project, and they um, have had unprecedented uh, success uh, legislatively with uh, either controlling or eliminating certain research animals or how they're used, right? So they, they started a massive campaign against our poor colleagues at the VA who do good work. Um, many of you know about that. 
And they went to the FDA and they had some issues there that they were able to raise awareness with and create trouble and some and some changes. And in addition to some other animals, they shut down a monkey study there. Those animals were all adopted out. There after the EPA, uh, again, dogs and some other animals were the focus. They got the USDA to stop doing toxoplasmosis with cats, uh, even though it was the poop of the cats that was being studied. And they currently are very active in a campaign in, against the NIH and monkeys where um, they've gotten some legislators, and many of you are aware of this, to uh, put some pressure on the NIH to uh, basically report to Congress about why animals and monkeys in particular are still necessary and uh, come up with a plan for reducing their numbers and adopting them out. And that's a whole other story. But dogs were the gateway species and now we're expanding to other animals. These animals will have to have somewhere to go when these laws pass. Maybe it's that little farm I just showed you. I don't think it's a coincidence. Uh, Peters jumped in on them. They attacked uh, Mizzou and uh, gave them a hard time about the muscular dystrophy work happening with dogs there. It's been a very active campaign against Texas A&M that's uh, caused a lot of pain to our colleagues uh, for the same kind of research with dogs. And now recently they have been supportive and involved in a measure, or they've been trying to pass a bill to basically uh, ban the breeding of research dogs for use in research uh, by, in Virginia, which is a target, the target is actually, intended target is in Vigo, who is one of our three top producers of dogs. Um, certainly, if they can shut down one of our three producers, that will have a very strong impact on how much research with dogs can happen across the country. And then in Wisconsin, where we have another uh, producer, our, our friends at Ridgeland Farms, also a major producer of research dogs for research. So that's two of the three big ones right there. Although grassroots groups sprung up, they also have support and some backing from PETA, though they don't talk about that and sometimes deny it, but it's true. And they have actually been able to ride this wave of propaganda generated by the Beagle Freedom Project initially to invoke dog breeding bans. And that means uh, you can't breed dogs for research, you can't keep them and sell them, you can't do research in these areas. There are now four little townships in Wisconsin that have active research dog breeding bands in effect. Many of you on the call probably don't know anything about that. The language in the ban uh, for the Spring Green uh, initiative or referendum was particularly troubling because uh, the language actually says it's banned because it offends public morals and decency. So improving and changing lives with necessary biomedical research offends public morals and decency. And that is now codified into this referendum. If you want to catch up on, get a, a good summary of the, uh, the legislative impact that the White Coat Waste and their friends have had on the government agencies, I encourage you to go ahead and look at this, look up this article that was written by David Grimm in Science at the end of last year. Um, you can take a screenshot of it now if you want. Remember what I said, whoever owns the adoption issue owns the conversation with the public, and that includes legislators. So why don't we own the conversation? This is what I intended to do with Homes for Animal Heroes from the start. Yes, I want to find homes for a dog. I love our dogs. I love dogs, period. I want to find as many homes for them as I can. But I also, and maybe more importantly, want to create a platform for us to communicate, right? A platform that allows them to be ambassadors for the truth instead of ambassadors for propaganda. We aren't able to tell those stories ourselves, so let Homes for Animal Heroes do it for you. We started doing this uh, before we even started planting dogs. I was running around the country and uh, talking about it and, you know, and also interviewing in newspapers and getting, and getting some crap for it, by the way. Um, but, but we've got to be able to tell our truth and we've got to be able to portray these animals as the heroes they are. We have to be able to show our, our love for them, our honor for them and our gratitude for them. That's why we want to find homes for them, not because they're victims, because they're heroes and they deserve it. So how's our program work? And we have a website that is constantly evolving and mostly it's because um, I still haven't caught up on some of the content I had to fix. Sorry, Marilyn. <laughs> you guys meet Marilyn a little bit. Um, but the three major goals of the program are to raise awareness about the fact that, you know, animals really are still necessary for biomedical progress and to explain that process, you know, that the process of basic research where we 
we, we learn about health and disease in biological systems and then move that all the way up to the applicable stage, you know, where we've collected enough information and we know enough that we can start drug development and create cures and treatments. So the public doesn't understand even that. They don't, when you say the word research, they don't even know what that means, which is why it's so easy for people like PETA to tell them there are alternatives in place to animals right now that could be used fully. We don't need animals anymore. There are full replacements. And of course, we know that's not true. But the public doesn't know that and they don't know why. And so that's one of the goals of this program, to educate them about the process. The other really important goal for me, and I, I hold this uh, very close to my heart, is to introduce these people you know, to the, lab, uh, the laboratory animal profession and, and the, lab, the, the veterinarians and the caregivers and the vet techs and the behaviorists and all these specially trained people who love these animals and are the ones who are caring for them seven days a week. Um, they don't know about us. They don't know anything about us. They don't know how we how we care for animals. They don't know that we love our animals. They don't know that just about all of us are here because we love animals. They don't know about all the specialized training we've uh, we've 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 gotten to do this work well. They don't know about IA cooks and compliance or any of that. So that's another part of this. And you know, look, lots of people. You, you might say, well, AMP is doing that, and I love AMP, of course, because I'm the chair of AMP, and FBR is doing that, and you know, there are there are uh, NAI is doing that. There are advocacy groups talking about this, and yeah, but they're not talking about it while they're holding a big fat shiny dog. Remember. The dog is what brought the Beagle Freedom Project their success. Actually having, when you own the adoption issue, and I mean own it, you own the conversation with the public. We need to own it, but we need your help to do that. And obviously, um, another great plus is that we get to rehome a lot of our dogs and we get to choose who they live with. We get to educate the people who get our dogs um, so that they understand why these animals are so important to them and everybody they love, including their pets. And they, they, they have a whole different sort of mindset about these animals. They truly are mascots for the truth, as opposed to mascots for lies and propaganda. And the people who have our dogs um, tell their stories and they, and they hold them up as, as models uh, for the heroic work that they've done and for the heroic work that researchers continue to do and public health officials continue to do. That is the whole point. There has to be an army of people who believe this, who can be uh, sort of homes for animal heroes spokespeople and go out and share this information with the world. And we have now started to really develop and build that. So there's a whole network of us. Uh, whether they're our fosters or the folks who have adopted our animals that are out there telling our truth to the public, some of whom are legislators, I'm sure. So where are we? Just to give you a sense, um, we are in 13 states right now, uh, more active in some than others. Here's a quick timeline of kind of how we shifted uh, from the beginning when we first started placing dogs in 2017. We had three states. We added six more in 2018, three more again in 2019. Excuse me, we'd like to add four more in 2020. Uh, COVID has slowed us down a little bit, um, but that's the goal. And uh, it's still it's still expansion and we very much need to do that because we get calls, multiple calls a month from institutions that, have, that are either in states that have this law or uh, wanna get ahead of the law that's coming and it is coming. So as I mentioned, this is what we want to do for 2020 specifically. Um, and here's 30. And that was Larson in the last slide. Um, we want to add four new states. We are working on seven new partnerships with various institutions. We'd like to increase the number of dogs rehomed by 20% in 2020. We're halfway through. I'll give you a sense of how many dogs we've placed annually. You know, we're placing uh, 20-ish or so in 2017. <laughs> Took us a little while. And then in 2018, we broke 50. In 2019, we well past 100, and uh, we would go past 150 this year, but we've made uh, an adjustment for where we think we can go based on uh, the institutions we're speaking with now for 150 dog goal for 2020. So how do we get funded? And uh, the truth of the matter is that nearly all of it comes from donations. Um, we do an annual a 5K run, although we do have some very generous um, corporate partners, and I want to take a minute, and they know who they are, and I will never say who they are. We have partnerships with them as well. I do want to take a moment to thank them. Uh, without their generosity, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do anything at all. Um, but still, for what we want to do, it's, it's not nearly enough, and uh, you know, so we need everybody to get on board. We need everybody to own this issue. 
so that the research community can once and for all own the conversation with the public, including the legislators. Uh, so uh, one of our, our colleagues, some of you may know her, Julie Kent, a dear friend of mine, she's out in North Carolina as part of the Research Triangle Branch ALAS group, um, had this great idea about starting a virtual 5K. Um, and so then she and Marilyn in our office, who you hear from in a minute, combined forces and, uh, and started this virtual race. Um, and it's pretty cool. You sign up for the race. Um, you, have, you get a little Facebook page and you, you drum up supporters, friends and family through social media to support you in your race. Um, you go to uh, people who do some all kinds of clever things. Uh, they have barbecue bake-offs. Whoever makes the best barbecue wins the pot of money. Everybody pays money to go to the barbecue. Uh, nail trims, dog nail trims. People go around the blocks and, and charge people for them to trim their nails. Some of our vet techs do this out in uh, North Carolina. Car washes. Uh, they go to different uh, businesses. And there have been several uh, beer places, beer pubs, that have had like a happy hour for this and allow the dogs in. Um, and then at some point after everyone's raised money, then generally uh, the regional groups will get together either by institution or by branch or some other regional uh, uh, organization of some sort. They'll get together and they'll have sort of this big festivity, this day where they go and they run together and some of them will walk and they bring their dogs, both their uh, non homes family hero dogs and their homes family hero dogs uh, to the race. And it's, and it's just this really uh, wonderful opportunity for us to celebrate uh, who these animals are, and they are heroes, as are the people who care for them and do this really, really necessary work for everybody we love. Um, so you know, um, the National Animal Interest Alliance is the 501c3 that the program Homes for Animal Heroes is parked in, um, but your funding, if you, if you make a donation and you earmark it for Homes for Animal Heroes, and certainly if you make it through the site uh, that Austin is going to share with you, or if he hasn't already, um, that will automatically go toward what we need for Homes for Animal Heroes to continue our expansion. And because we're a 501c3, all of that is tax deductible. Um, what does some of the money go toward? Here's Apollo. He's so cute. Can't take it. Look how felt he is, too. Just a gorgeous little thing on his new little dog bone. Welcome, Matt. Cute. Um, supplies. So we have, a, we have a foster network that we screen through John Sansonito's Information Network Associates Group. Uh, they get background checks, but they also get checked for animal rights affiliation. We need to make sure that absolutely nobody knows where adults came from, and we need to make sure that they have no opportunity, the animal rights community, in other words, to find some little crack and get into our situation here. So um, we, we do that uh, by screening our fosters, our adopters, our coordinators. We need to know who we're working with. A lot of times people will say to me, hey, why don't you work with such and such shelter because we've been adopting our dogs out through them for years. And I always have to say, I won't do that. And I can't do that because I can't control who those people hire. I don't know who they are. And we need to know everybody involved in this organization because we have promised our partners who are providing dogs for adoption that we will maintain their anonymity. And so I'm very protective of that. Um, and that increases our challenges then. Those screenings cost money. <laughs> Uh, the fosters are voluntary, but the coordinators are salaried. Certainly Marilyn, who is the on the grounds person for uh, Homes Family Heroes and in charge of getting this race running and countless other things, in addition to her other roles in NAIA, she has to be paid. Um, we supply food, crates, beddings, leashes, collars, toys, every other thing that's necessary for our fosters to train our dogs and get them prepared for residential living, right? Um, our dogs don't know stairs. In many cases, they don't know car rides. They don't know noisy cars, uh, noisy traffic. They don't know noisy dinners with family. They don't know necessarily children. They may not know cats. All of these things, they have to, uh, flushing toilets, vacuum cleaners, you name it. These are all new things to our dogs. So they need to, they need to be familiarized with all of that. Many of them need to be potty trained. Um, and we do all of that in a fairly standardized way because we want their adoption to be permanent. That's the, po that's the goal. The goal is to find them a permanent loving home uh, with someone, a family that they're compatible with, that understands and believes in our mission and continues to be an ambassador for our truth when they're out and about. And you notice, if you look at Apollo, he's wearing a leash that says, ask me why I'm a hero, Homes for Animal Heroes. And we provide those as well because they're gen they generate conversation amongst people um, and the public when they have their dogs on walks. Veterinary care, we, have, we cover all of that while they're in foster care and they do all kinds of crazy things. Aside from the regular preventive stuff, you know, some of the labs eat rocks and acorns and things like this. It's just crazy stuff. And then of course, expanding in and of itself, 
is expensive. I mean, just to place one dog costs between uh, three and five hundred dollars when you take everything into account, and that doesn't account for expansion. So, your money will go a long way um, if you if you if you support us now and uh, during the run. Five ways to get involved. So here's uh, this is cute. So this this dog is Maui, and this family adopted her and Marlene, who was one of her puppies, and so sweet. We have a billion of these pictures. If you go on our website, you can see some really cute pictures. If you go to our Facebook page, you'll see some more. And I know I'm over time, but I'm almost done, and I have so many cool things to show you. So hang on with me for just a little bit. And if you are interested in hanging out for questions, I will hang out with you because I have nothing to do and no place to go. And neither do most of you, I'm sure. <laughs> so ways to get involved, uh, support the run. Uh, there's a link at the top of the slide, and my understanding is that Austin has also supplied you with the link. There it is in the chat. Um, you can go in there and make a donation, um, organize a team, which is even better, and start collecting donations from your family and friends to support you and this cause. Become a foster volunteer. Um, we we'll provide you with everything, as I said. We will guide you through how to train uh, the training of our animals so that they'll be accustomed to residential uh, settings and really successful adopted partners. Um, by the way, the other thing is that if someone adopts one of our dogs in the contract, they have to sign. It stipulates that if for some reason their relationship doesn't work out, they must return the dog to Homes for Animal Heroes. We do not want these dogs ending up in shelters or in anybody else's hands. I'm proud to say that that's only happened, uh, gosh, maybe two or three times, and we've placed over 300 dogs at this point. Um, and those dogs have come back into our network, and we've found them other homes. Um, if you're interested in, in, in fostering, we need a lot. We need fosters. This is something we really, really need, and we need a lot of them right now in Wisconsin. If you're in, if you're in Wisconsin and you can be a foster for Homes for Animal Heroes, I want you to contact, uh, either go online and, 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 well, contact Marilyn, and that information is coming at the, at the Homes for Animal Heroes office. That'd be wonderful. Um, but if you're interested, you saw the states, and you can find all that stuff on the website again. Uh, you can you can click around until you find the. Uh, coordinator for your region and speak to them and then you'll be asked to fill out an application and uh, we'll, you know, we'll do the whole process and hopefully you will join us as a foster. That would be a huge, huge, huge help. Um, this little cutie on the right here is Thor and his parents are to the left and they were, they fostered two dogs for us and then this one came through and they were like, no, nope, keeping them. So he's a real, he's adorable, ridiculously cute, those beagles. I can't even take it out cute there. I'm going to have to turn this down because I can't take it. I'm distracted. Um, you can adopt a dog. That's Part of the reason we're here, if you go to the website, you'll see a tab for available dogs and you can click through and find them. Uh, you go to the states there that uh, are either the state you're in or the state you're closest to. And then uh, the point of contact for adoptions and fostering, with the exception of Wisconsin, the point of contact if you're interested in fostering in Wisconsin right now is Maryland and that number's coming up. All the other states, um, just uh, there'll be a coordinator there. The point of contact is the coordinator. We have one singular point of contact for our partners in those states and us. I don't want too many people, uh, too many cooks in the kitchen, right? I try to streamline this communication again to protect our partners, our research institutions, so we can tell this truth for all of us. Like us on Facebook and more importantly, and go do that because there's really cute stuff on there. But more important than liking us is invite your friends to like us. Now, when I've given this talk in person, there's about 10 minutes of me showing you how to invite your friends to like us on Facebook, and then me holding you accountable for doing it. So you're all lucky that I can't be wherever you are in probably hundreds of different places right now. <laughs> but please like us, but then most importantly, invite your friends to like us. We have to get the support. We have to get the eyes on us. We have to own the adoption issue if we're ever gonna own the conversation with the public, including our legislators. Help at an event, become a coordinator yourself. And you can see um, on the left here, you'll see a booth that's set up. We have partnerships with Petco and PetSmart, and they've been very kind to allow us to uh, do adoption events there or, or uh, be a part of their, their adoption events. Uh, certain veterinary offices will do that with us as well. I and mean, we do find uh, adopters and fosters this way. So that's been very helpful. All right, so what else have we been up to, right? So. Just quickly, and we are coming to the end now, so those of you who have to run to the bathroom, just hang on a second. <laughs> um, so what we did is we, we, we kind of, we usurped the BFP's game, right? They created this situation whereby they used our dogs by really exploiting us and taking them from us and then saying that they got them some other way. 
and they used them as, as mascots for propaganda. And that's how they generated their supporters. So now we have uh, done the same thing, but we have uh, adopted our dogs through legitimate means and uh, placed them through legitimate means. And then we use them as mascots for the truth. And so do all of the people who foster and adopt them. So we're creating our own little army of truth tellers uh, as opposed to propaganda sharers, right? And so we've done that. The next thing that we did, and I'm really excited to share this with you, what else has Homes for Animal Heroes and its supporters been up to? Well, our good friend, uh, Patty Strand, who again is the president of NAIA and co-founder of Homes for Animal Heroes, got involved in the Washington State Bill. So the Beagle Freedom Project uh, so, you know, submitted a bill there, another Beagle Freedom Bill. Patty got involved with some of the institutions in that area, reworked the language and amended it to something they could live with. And then we renamed it the Homes for Animal Heroes Act. This is a big deal. And you won't see that name anywhere on the Beagle Freedom Project website. They talk about the states that have laws now, but they fail to mention at all that the one in Washington state is called the Homes for Animal Heroes Act. That is a much different name just by itself. Homes for Animal Heroes Act has an entirely different connotation, completely different music behind the words than the Beagle Freedom Law. This Homes for Animal Heroes Act is a title about heroes, not victims. When you own the animal adoption issue, you own the conversation. That's what we're trying to do. So Patty pulled that off last year. And then our very, very good friend, Tom Leach, who wears a lot of hats, but most of you will know him as a, uh, because of his affiliation with the New Jersey Association for Biomedical Research. Uh, he and Barbara Reichman from NAIA worked uh, together on Bill in New Jersey. Again, that was, uh, was proposed by the Beagle Freedom Project. It was supposed to be another Beagle Freedom Bill. And that one uh, was signed into law. Oops, that should say, no, that shouldn't say 215. That, sh that just happened in 2020, my apologies. In January of 2020, that one was signed into law. So that's another Homes for Animal Heroes Act. So of the laws that have passed, two of them are Homes for Animal Heroes Acts. So what do we have left to take over? So now it's just my time to dream. <laughs> what if, what if we could have a Homes for Animal Heroes Outreach and Adoption Center, right? If, what if we could flip that whole rock model on its end, right? And this is a picture of me dreaming, right? So this is what I usually do. I don't, uh, I, get, I get really tired of reality because I think it's problematic for a lot of reasons. And I start looking toward the way things should be. And, you know, then eventually, as they say, dreams become realities and these things become full circle. Well, this is my dream right now. And I think there's a lot of power to it. And I think we, we are at a point now where if we can get our community to uh, get on board with this and we can get enough uh, resources and some sponsors for making this actually happen, you know, imagine, imagine what would happen, right? If you, if you had dogs that are done with their studies, you know, and as we know, when the study ends, the money ends, if you had a place to send them where they could get uh, shaped for adoption and people could come to this outreach and adoption center to learn about their truth, um, and also adopt animals. And, you know, why recreate the wheel, right? Our friends at the Beagle Freedom Project had some good ideas about uh, what to do with a center like this. So we can house the offices for the growing Homes for Animal Heroes team and volunteers in our new outreach and adoption center. We can have large indoor and outdoor spaces for the public and the press to interact with our research animal heroes, not liberated research, whatever the hell it was that they said, right? We can have dedicated spaces for school presentations and videos uh, and exhibits about the three R's, how about that? And, and provide innovative ways that everybody can help. So if we could ever get a commitment for this, that would be amazing. And I'm gonna make you a promise now. I will commit to you that if the, our community can commit to something like this and organize uh, resources and make this thing happen, that I will sell my house in Texas and move to this particular place and run it myself. We'll do outreach out of there. We'll do we'll do uh, interviews with the press there. We'll do school viewings, uh, school uh, shows and exhibits there. We we can do anything. Podcasts from there. We can do anything from there. It's sort of my dream. But since it's my webinar, I get to share my dream with you. All right, now here's the information. Take a screenshot. If you have questions that I can't answer and uh, at the end of this, which is in a couple seconds, um, or if you're interested in being a foster in Wisconsin, there's a phone number there for you to call. Um, you can also go to our website and our Facebook page. 
And I want to thank you so very much for your time. And I also want to thank all of our vendor sponsors for making this opportunity possible. Um, we appreciate you all so very much. Your support means a lot. We couldn't do any of it without you, so thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Dr. Buckmaster. Uh, we have several questions from the audience. And Dr. Buckmaster, I know you had some trouble with your, your webcam feed and compatibility with seeing your presentation, but we'd like, there you go. You read in my mind, Dr. Buckmaster. The first well, I can see it. I can see it because there's no hair. <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't help myself. Couldn't help myself. Okay. Uh, Dr. Me. Buckmaster, here's the first question. Do you think that people who are incarcerated see their incarceration as a badge of honor after their sentence? Well, you mean like animal rights people? Yes, I believe that's, yes. Yes, I, absolutely. Oh, look, go online and uh, watch one of the animal rights, uh, if you can find a video of any of the animal rights conferences. Kevin and Jonas is like a rock star when he walks on stage. They go nuts for him. So yeah, I do think it's, I think that for many of them, it's, it's viewed as a badge of honor. I'm sure that in the beginning, um, there was a lot of support for the Being Freedom Project's initiative because Kevin was involved as well as Shannon. So I think so, yeah. Here's the next question, Dr. Buckmaster. Is there a way to highlight that what they do, and they I assume means the Beagle Freedom Project and organizations like them, is there a way to highlight what they do and how they go about it is criminal in contrast to how they portray animal research? Well, uh, sure, you can try that. Um, we've, I've tried to tell the truth. Many of us have tried to tell the truth to the media, but the media usually is coming to us because they've already been, they've had the story fed to them by the animal rights people. Um, you can try that in, uh, in a legislative hearing, but nobody takes kindly to that. And it's really not the point. I mean. I don't think there's a lot of, I think there's value in revealing what they're up to by sharing the truth and allowing people to stumble across themselves, the incongruity there. Well, wait a minute. I see with my own eyes and, you know, and I'm hearing from you and I'm seeing something that is really different from what the animal rights people told me. I think they must have lied to me. I think there's value in that. And I, and I will always put sharing our truth ahead of you know, uh, trashing the animal rights people. I mean, here's the other thing. The animal rights people aren't wrong about everything. They just don't have a solution. They have an agenda, right? And and, and, and we also know that we've got gaps to tighten up and we work on that. Um, but I don't, I'm not so sure that that's valuable. I mean, so what will happen? So right now we're the monsters. No one's heard from us. We're demons. And so if I go trash somebody who's in the animal rights community where you go do that, they'll say, well, of course they said that. They're monsters and demons. They're disgusting people. Not going to get us anywhere. What's going to get us somewhere is sharing our truth. Um, and then people will believe what they believe. It's not our job to convince anybody of anything. Uh, it's our job to share the truth and allow them to stumble upon it, to make the realizations themselves with the information they have. The problem they've had this whole time is they haven't had a full set of information. And that's what Homes Family Heroes is providing, an opportunity for people to hear the truth, to see the truth and to play with and pet the truth. Can't hear you, Austin. Apologies, I was muted. Dr. Buckmaster, here's the next question. Is there an automatic email alert for people working with research animals to get a chance to adopt them in Canada that you know of? The, <laughs> no, there's nothing. So we are, so our friends and colleagues in Canada, um, one of whom was uh, directly responsible for helping arrange this webinar, who I adore very much. Um, I went to Canada and I gave a talk in Homes for Animal Heroes a while ago, and Canadians really, really want this program. As you can see, we're still trying to develop it in the United States, and we have quite a few states to get to. It's, it's all a matter of resources. Um, so there's nothing that I know of like that yet. Uh, that may be possible, and uh, in order to do that, you'll have to really contact Marilyn in the office, and you just you saw that information a moment ago, hopefully took a screenshot, and I think this will be recorded also if you need to get back to it again. So there's nothing like that yet. Um, you can follow us if you're Canadian. You can follow our webpage and our website and look under the available logs listed um, if you're interested in adopting. So uh, and we also put that up on the Facebook page, and we also have an Instagram page, and every once in a while I'll see some cutie on what Marilyn posted. 
Dr. Buckmaster, do you think that expanding the program to include cats might happen soon? Again, um, I think that the, what did I call it? The Outreach and Adoption Center, the Home Channel Outreach and, and Adoption Center could replace what the Beagle Freedom Project is already setting up on the East Coast for that reason, right? They, they bought a, they went from a building that they were gonna put dogs in to a farm that they could take all animals in, right? And there's a reason for that. They believe that their animal rights friends are going to be able to push some of these legislative initiatives through and that there are going to be more animals that need homes and they want them so they can tell these false stories about them. Right. So if we have something similar to that and we've got to start somewhere right now, we, we, are, we are working exclusively with dogs and that's got its own challenges. And a lot of it has to do with resources. Right. Once we are firmly established, if we had an adoption center, then I think that might be more straightforward. Um, but we'd have to have some we'd have to have. Uh, you know, there'd have to be a real uh, coming together of the community to provide the kind of resources necessary to create a center like that. I would argue that, uh, you know, indirects, some of the grant money that comes in could be earmarked for that. If the government isn't doing it, then maybe the institutions themselves can do it. Uh, corporations can do that. Um, because something like that would have to be maintained. Listen, I have run one of the largest animal care, research animal care programs in the nation for years and years. Um, and I could run a center like this as well. And I'd love to staff it, in fact, in my pipe dream of dreams uh, with lab animal experts. So the animals get exactly the, the, the care they should, right? And maybe even animals like monkeys would have a place to go. They can't be adopted, obviously. But if we had real expertise, and this is one of the things we're lacking in the sanctuaries that exist right now, um, they're not all good. Very few of them are good and very few of them have space. Um, but if we had a center like that and we had lab animal people staffing it, then we could, we could adopt animals out we could introduce the public to all kinds of, of research heroes and, and tell their stories and why they're relevant for the cures and treatments that they benefit from and their pets benefit from and everybody they love benefits from. You know, this could be an unprecedented opportunity to educate the public in a, you know, come come see us kind of way. I, you know, people might come and, you know, gosh, I keep dreaming here and I'm not even drinking wine yet, but I should have done that. And I will do that right after this. Um, you know, but people would come like, remember Kindness Ranch? It turns out they're very animal rights uh, oriented and we didn't know that, but now we know. Um, well, they have people that go there every year and, you know, just, just to help out and volunteer. It's like, a, it's like a family vacation. Imagine, imagine if we had something like that where we could do all of these things. Yeah, I'd love for that to happen, Austin. And please call me Cindy. I told you that at the beginning. I'd love for that to happen. Um, but we'll need something like this to make that really work. It's difficult enough now to create foster networks for one species. So, okay, that's, for us. Master. Yeah, that's what I have to say about that. See, what did I tell you? All right, go ahead. <laughs> uh, here's the next question, Dr. Bugmaster. Oh, if gosh. you work at a place <laughs> that is hesitant to adopt for public relations reasons, for example, if they suffered previous negative public relations, do you have any suggestions as to how to approach the subject and convince them of their thoughts or you know, work, them, work their way out of it? Well, I can tell you that there are two institutions who themselves came out and announced their partnership with Homes for Animal Heroes. Um, one was Mizzou and the other was Texas A&M. Um, in Mizzou's case, uh, they were getting uh, attacked and sued and everything else by the Beagle Freedom Project. It was a real massive propaganda campaign, horrible. Um, and for a time, and maybe some of those people are listening, um, I think that that did help spin their PR in the opposite direction. It certainly uh, allowed them an opportunity to share a truth that was theirs for a long time, which, they, which was that they've been adopting animals out for a long time, like most of us. They couldn't talk about it, but when they announced their partnership with us, that did seem to help a little. So, um, listen. <laughs> There are some people who are in, in, in the upper echelons of our organizations who are never going to be able to abandon that fear. They cannot, simply cannot embrace the power of transparency because they're too afraid to do so. And because of that, we are experiencing a tsunami of, of legislative initiatives that we may not recover from. And you can't be mad at them. We've got to convince them somehow that transparency is the way out of this. With transparency comes the acknowledgement of some of our own gaps, and we've got to we've got to be willing to pull together and tighten those up and do what's best for animals and people. We have to be able to move together, come together, and move together in loving ways to create loving solutions for animals and people. So you do your best to share our website with them. Uh, 
maybe you know go online and, and look up uh, the institutions I mentioned and see if you can't find those press releases. Um, if you look up Home Center Heroes, you'll see different write-ups by various groups. They can go and they can look and see that we're telling we're telling uh, this community's truth without identifying anybody, and that's 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 our promise. The institutions don't get known. Um, the people that are in the institutions don't get known. That's our promise. And so this is a very safe way for those people who are afraid, and this might be something you pitch to those people, to try and be transparent. Thank you, Dr. Buckmaster. That was the last question. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Marilyn Kuhn, the Director of Development for the National Animal Interest Alliance, who will read the names of people and organizations who donated during the webinar. Ms. Kuhn. Thank you. I wanted to uh, thank everyone at Animal Care Systems and Dr. Cindy Buckmaster for allowing me to chime in this morning on this presentation. And I say this, well, it's after this morning now, I am in Portland, Oregon, where NAIA is headquartered. Um, I want to say thank you to those of you who have gone into that donation page and made, page and made a gift during this webinar this morning and let you know that that page will remain live. Cindy gave out um, on her last slide the email contact director.hah at naiaonline.org, as well as our phone number, 503-227-8450, and our email address. You can find us most easily at homesforanimalheroes.com, which will redirect to org. Um, I wanted to just let you know that any of those means that you choose to reach out to us, I will be available and you can speak with me directly if you have any questions about the Homes for Animal Heroes program. Let me just read a couple um, notes that we received during the webinar. We have an anonymous donor who wrote in, Cindy, thank you for your dedica dedicated work. Um, another anonymous donor, thank you, Animal Heroes. Robert Tierney, on behalf of Animal Care Systems, made a gift. Thank you. We also Thank have you, a Robert. thanks, Robert. Thank you. We have a gift from uh, Teresa McKernan, uh, and a gift from Mike Dvorak. And then we have a note in honor of Dr. Cindy Buckmaster and her work to rehome animal heroes and share the truth about biomedical research that makes all of our lives better. Thank you. And again, that web page will be open uh, for anybody else who would be interested in making a contribution to the Homes for Animal Heroes program. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Kuhn. And Dr. Buckmaster, thank you once again for all your time today. Thank you so much, Austin. You've had to put up with me multiple times in preparation for this, and I still couldn't get it completely right. Um, I thank all the vendors, but I really want to give a huge shout out to Animal Care Systems. And this was just very generous of you. Yeah, the resources, the time involved, and the professional way with which you've done this. I, I really, really appreciate it. <clears throat> As you know, we're all stuck inside for a while, and so I'm not having the opportunity to go out on the, on the road and talk to folks. And so this gave me an opportunity to connect with my tribe <laughs> uh, about something really important. Uh, this race is generally in the spring and that's been pushed off. So we're hoping to come back to it in the fall. Um, but uh, this has been an invaluable opportunity for uh, me and Marilyn to remind our community of what it is we're up to. And uh, I really appreciate you and the folks in animal care systems a lot. And you have really cool round cages too. I think those things are amazing. So. I'll leave with that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Backmaster. This webinar was sponsored by Animal Care Systems and was in no way endorsed by ALAS. Each webinar in the series is produced independently by each company. A special thank you goes to Jay Campbell of Somark Innovations for his persevering support of the series. For information about upcoming webinars, visit the ACE community postings and ALAS LinkedIn page. Today's webinar also will be freely available in the coming days on the Animal Care Systems website. Keep an eye out for our next webinar announcement later this summer. We wish you all good health, and until next time, we hope you keep up the good science. Bye-bye.